For we contend not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the world rulers of this present darkness, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. From the American Midwest comes this present darkness, where we explore the supernatural aspects of the paranormal from a Catholic perspective and expose the dark forces in our world and beyond, both seen and unseen. Now, here's your host, historian, paranormal investigator, author, and ghost lorist, Ursula Bielski. Well, hello, my friends. This is Ursula Bielski, and this is This Present Darkness. I am a lifetime parapsychologist, historian, folklorist, and lifetime Catholic. And on this show, we look at everything in the world of the supernatural from a Catholic perspective perspective. Today, I am so excited to have with us a very, very, very special guest. And we'll get to that in just a moment. I just want to take a second to thank all of you who have donated to our fundraiser to release our 17 families from slavery in Pakistan. We have a long way to go with our goal, but it's not a huge goal. We need $15,000 to release 17 families, including 22 children from brick slavery in Pakistan. These are beautiful children that are learning all about Jesus from our friend Karam, and uh, they need to be back in school. They need to get out of the hot sun and slave labor all day, and so do their parents. So please, if you can just get maybe $5, uh, if you can spare it, into our fundraiser, we can get to that goal. I'm going to put the link in the description. Thank you so much today. I'm so excited. As many of you know, uh, I started this show during the pandemic and a big part of it was because of my getting out of using occult tools and methods in paranormal investigation. This was something that I had never done in my first, you know, 15 years of being a paranormal investigator, but with all of the TV shows and everything that that and that explosion of interest in the culture and the paranormal in the early 2000s, I got swept up in that. And I felt like I need to, to do these things in order to stay relevant. You know, this is what people want. We started to do ghost hunting on our ghost tours. And um, needless to say, I learned my lesson uh, the hard way, <laughs> as you guys know. And I also learned so much more about my faith and got so much closer to Jesus and the, the proper uh, practice of my faith from so many people online and organizations online. And number one on that list were the Marian Fathers at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Um, I started with my husband to watch the on uh, live stream mass every morning. That still happens at 9 a.m. Eastern time every single day. I highly recommend it. I started to watch Father Chris Alars explaining the faith series on Saturday mornings. Incredible show, highly recommend it. Learned so much about Catholicism. And, uh, as the weeks went by, I began to realize I had gone so far from my faith, my Catholic faith, in the way that I was practicing what I still feel is my calling to look into paranormal activity and try to help people that um, have issues with it. Uh, so I'm so grateful for to the Marian Fathers. And I have here with me today one of the Marian Fathers, Father Anthony Gramlick is the assistant rector at the Shrine in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And he is also an amateur astronomer, which I never knew because he rarely says anything about his personal life or background when he uh, preaches during mass. So I was so excited to find this out. And we're going to talk today about the connection between astronomy and one of the most famous and popular and influential apparitions of our blessed mother. And that is her appearance at Guadalupe, Mexico in the 1500s to Juan Diego and her permanent mark that she left behind in the Tilma of Guadalupe. So without further ado, help me welcome Father Anthony Gramlich. Father Anthony, thank you so much for being here with us today. Welcome. Welcome. I had no idea you were interested in astronomy. <laughs> Uh, how on earth did you, uh, did is that something that you've always been interested in? Yeah, I was always interested in uh, astronomy from the time I was a child. 
um, always lo love looking at the stars and the moon and the sky. And it was when I came here to Stockbridge, Massachusetts, we're uh, in New England and we're in the mountains, we're about a thousand feet up and there's not a lot of lights here, it's really beautiful. And so I began taking walks at night and just looking up at the stars and just being fascinated just um, of the beauty uh, of it and seeing all these stars and seeing galaxies and everything. And so I, I used to go out on our lawn and lay down and used to watch sh shooting stars, satellites come by. Um, sometimes you could see like, I guess like the Milky Way or other galaxies. And then eventually I bought a telescope and began looking at the planets and the moon and just, um, it just became fascinating. And then after that, I began studying more about the constellations because there's a constant with the constellations that, that goes all the way back to the Greek times and the Greek names and began studying the stars. And, um, and I wanted to get to know where are the different constellations. And so it's like connecting the dots where you, you go from star to star and you draw a line and you connect the dots and it produces a shape and yeah. that has like a, a Greek name to it. So I became fascinated with that. And then eventually when the phones came out, um, they have apps on the phone where you can just point the phone off and it'll show you the, the constellation up there, show you which wow. constellation is mm -hmm. there in the sky. So so it's really interesting. So that that's the way I initially became interested in basic uh, astronomy. And then when I was studying Our Lady Guadalupe, I became more interested because of the stars on our cloak. And eventually I found out that the stars on our cloak um, through modern computer um, astronomy, where they can take any time, any day in the point of history and go back and actually see a star map of that day, of that time in wow. history. And so what first fascinated me was um, they they actually took the star map of the, of the morning of December 12th, 1531 in Mexico, and they compared it with Our Lady Guadalupe's tilma. And if you switch the tilma from, from, uh, from left to right like this, it creates a star map on there with north, south, east, and west. And so when they, when they put the image of the tilma up to that star map on December 12th, 1531, it matched exactly. Father, we have a lot of viewers that are not Catholic and uh, actually a lot of viewers who are pagan. Could mm -hmm. you tell briefly the story of Our Lady of Guadalupe and exactly how the image came to be? Sure. So there, there is, um, so in, in Mexico in 1531, the, um, the, the, the Spaniards had already conquered uh, was modern day Mexico. And so you had the Aztecs, you had different Native American tribes there. You had very few converts to Christianity. One of the converts, uh, his name was Juan Diego, and he was on his church. He was on his way to church one day on Tepeyac Hill, and he had this apparition of the Blessed Mother. The Blessed Mother appeared to him on Tepeyac Hill, but she appeared as a Native American princess, someone who he could relate to. And he asked her to go to the bishop and asked the bishop if a, a shrine, a temple, could be built on that Tepeyac Hill. And so what Juan Diego went there, it was actually December 9th when she first appeared. Juan Diego went to the bishop. Uh, the bishop did not believe Juan Diego. He sent him back. And then Our Lady came again to Juan Diego, told him to go back to the bishop. And Juan Diego was, he was a poor Native American. He, he wasn't comfortable speaking to the bishop. And, people in authority. So he goes back and then the bishop says, tell her, tell the Blessed Mother to send me a sign. He said, um, he said, if you could send me Castilian roses, then I will believe her and I will build the church. Well, the first thing is it was December, so roses don't grow in December. Second of all, he was asking for Castilian roses, which only grow in Castile, Spain. They do not grow in Mexico. So it would have been a miracle 
to have roses grow in December in, in you know, the frozen desert and to have it and to have Castilian roses, a specific kind of rose grow that is not native to Mexico. So then Juan Diego, uh, he went back and then his, his uncle became very sick. And so on December 12th, Juan Diego wanted to avoid his appointment with the Blessed Mother. He was, he was so humble. And so he, he tried going around and Our Lady intercepted him. And Our Lady told him that his uncle would be okay. And the Blessed Mother appeared to his uncle Juan Diego and cured him of his illness. And then she, she told him um, that she would provide the sign for the bishop. So she told him to go up on a hill and to uh, take the flowers. So there were flowers, there were Castilian roses and flowers of all different kinds to take the flowers, to uh, pick them, and then to put them in his tilma and then to bring them to her. So he picked all the flowers, he put them in his tilma. So you have to think of the tilma as almost like a long garment that went in front of Juan Diego, almost down uh, past his knees. And so he took this tilma and then Our Lady arranged all the roses and flowers in his tilma. And she told him to keep those roses and flowers hidden until he sees the bishop. And so he hid them in his tilma and he walked all the way to the bishop and um, the bishop made him wait, his servants made him wait and the servants were curious, what do you have in your tilma? You know, what do you have there? And everything, he said, no, I'm not supposed to show you the blessed. The Blessed Mother said not to show you. So finally, when he went to the bishop, he said to the bishop, I have the sign that you want it from Our Lady. I have the Castilian roses. I have these beautiful roses and beautiful flowers that are not native to show you. And so um, to show you that she's speaking to me and that she wants the church built, the, the, her temple built. And so then when Juan Diego, when he then um, showed the bishop the flowers. He then unveiled his tilma and the flowers went to the floor. The bishop saw the flowers, but then what he saw on, his, on the tilma of Juan Diego was the image of the Blessed Virgin Mary, what we call our Lady Guadalupe, of how the Blessed Mother appeared to him um, in, a, in a Native American type of dress, type of form with Native American symbols, pictographs on his Tilma. And so the bishop went to his knees. He was crying because not only did he see the roses, but he saw the image of Our Lady. And then they went to Juan Diego's uncle, and Juan Diego's uncle told them that uh, the Blessed Mother had appeared to him and had revealed her name as Our Lady of Guadalupe. And so that's where we get the name of Our Lady Guadalupe. And then shortly after that, then um, they built a little church on Tepeyac Hill. Juan Diego was then um, showing the Native Americans the, the, the tilma with the image of Our Lady and explaining the story to, him, to the Native Americans. And as he was explaining the story to the Native Americans, uh, many of them were accepting baptism from both his story and the symbols on the image because the, the Aztecs, the Aztecs and Native Americans had a pictographic language with many symbols. So they would write with, with symbols, with pictures. And so the whole image on the tilma was a story that was being told to the Native Americans about their, their culture, their life, their history, their universe. It was, it was speaking all symbols to them that they could relate to, but it was symbols that was also related to Christianity at the same time. And so um, there, was, there were so many conversions. There were so many baptisms that the Franciscan priests said that they, they could not lift their arms because they, they had baptized hundreds wow. of thousands of people. And there were 10 million Native Americans, about 10 million, we, we, we don't really know the exact number, 9 to 10 million Native Americans from all over what we call the region in Mexico uh, that were converted to Christianity uh, in such a short amount of time. And the, and the Spaniards began accepting the Native Americans because there was a lot of hostility between the Spaniards and the Native Americans. There were uh, lots, of, lots of really bad Spaniards that were treating, enslaving the Native Americans, treating them harshly, 
really treating them bad. The, there were good Spaniards that were there. The, the, the priests were trying uh, to help the Native Americans. So you, so you had this cultural war between the Native Americans and the Spaniards. And that image actually not only converted the Native Americans, but also converted the Spaniards. Also brought them back to their fate to accept the Native Americans. And then both the Spaniards and the Native Americans began intermarrying. So it brought two different cultures together, which formed what we call uh, mestizo, which means mix, which means uh, Mexico. Hmm. That's where we get the name Mexico, which means mestizo. It means a mixed race between Native Americans and Spaniards. And, and you still see that um, in, in Central America and in uh, South America of this mixing of, of two races uh, between the Spaniards and the Native Americans. You don't see that so much in the United States or Canada. There, there, there wasn't as, as, as much intermarrying or, or mingling. There, there was, but not, not as much, not, not, not like Mexico, where you see that, that blend in there. So that, that's kind of a little bit of the story in a nutshell. And the, so the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which was on cactus fiber, has remained intact since 1531, there have been scientific tests and invest investigations of the image. They even noticed that the paint on the image, it, it's not paint that's used with any colors of this world. Um, the only chemical that they saw in, in the image itself when, the, when they took it, they, it, it wasn't any colors or pigments of this world. The only chemical that they noticed in there was Castilian roses, was the chemical of Castilian roses. Oh, wow. Which is amazing. Oh, I've never heard that before. So, th so that's why amazing. The, the Mexican people say that when the Blessed Mother, when she was uh, rearranging the roses on Juan Diego's tilma, that she was actually painting her own image with the roses on her, on her, on his tilma. And that's why she, she's an artist. So th this could be great if anyone's an artist out there. Um, that this would be a, a miraculous image to study that how can an image like this only have the uh, what we pigment or chemical of Castilian roses and, and there's many and there's many other miraculous things about, about the image um, itself that, that is just amazing from an artist's point of view from a scientific point of view they, they've also studied the eyes of the image so the, with electron microscopes, they're able to go into the images and the eyes and there's, the eyes are 3D, which is impossible to paint. And there's images in the eyes where you can see Juan Diego, you see the bishop, you see the servants. So there's about 13, I think they've discovered about 13 figures oh. in her eyes itself. Uh, there's a lot of Native Americans. You see like a little child that's there. You see a woman. I think that's holding a child or having a child. And um, and yeah, and they, they've discovered that in the eyes, which which is impossible. So it's impossible to paint a 3D image in the eyes, but then to paint figures in the eyes itself, a, a reflection, a reflection of her eyes. And so I we, had mentioned to you in my email that I found that article about you uh, and the, the image of Guadalupe because I had found this YouTube video where someone had turned the the constellations in the Toma on the side and put it into a computer program that played it as music and it's exactly. this beautiful perfectly harmonious music yes 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 so the, the so the, the, there's been many um you know many miraculous discoveries about the image the the other thing that the mexican people say because she has the, the, the people that the Blessed Mother looks at are in her eyes that every time we look at the Tilma, the image, we are in her eyes because we are her children and she loves us. And so we're, we're in the eyes of the Blessed Mother every time we look at the image and she looks at us much as the, you know, the, the original on December 12th, 1531, the the characters that were there, the people yeah. that were there are, are imprinted in her eyes. And so that's what this, the, the image really say. also backs up our, our conception of Our Lady as the Queen of Heaven. I just talked about this last week on this show, 
because so many um, Protestants, evangelicals, they they say that the idea of Mary as the queen of heaven is a, from an ancient pagan cult and it's not a Christian idea and there's no biblical basis for it, which of course there is. But, and a lot of that comes from the book of Revelation, which is absolutely ingrained in the image of Guadalupe, is it not? Yeah, the, the, there's there's more to it about Mary being queen of heaven. So if you go back to the, to the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament, if you go back to like David or Solomon, the Old Testament um, had, they, they, they practiced not monogamy, but what we would call polygamy. I mean, where they would have many wives, many wives and, and concubines. And, um, and I, I don't know why it was practiced. It was just practiced in the ancient culture. And so you had David, they had many wives. Solomon had about a thousand wives. And so in, in ancient Israel, there, there was a big contention. If you have a thousand wives and you have the king, who's the queen? Who would be the queen? You would have a thousand women fighting over the queenship. So in ancient Israel, what they would do is instead of having uh, all these concubines and wives fighting over who was to be queen, they would always appoint the mother of the king to be the queen. So in ancient Israel, the mother was always the queen, the queen mother. She was always the queen. And so you see that with uh, David and Bathsheba, where Bathsheba is the queen. And so she intercedes for her son Solomon, but she's, but she's the queen also. I mean, David, um, I'm sorry, but Solomon, with Solomon with a thousand wives, you see Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, is the queen. And not any of Solomon's wives, but Bathsheba is the queen. And, and so when that, someone went in something from Solomon, they would go to Bathsheba and say, could you to talk Bathsheba. to him? Exactly. Which is why we go to Mary and say, like, could you talk to Jesus for me? So, so, we, so following ancient Israel, and remember, Jesus was Jewish. Jesus right. was Jewish. We we forget that Jesus was Jewish. I mean, we 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 kind of forget that cultural tie. But Jesus Jesus was Jewish, and a lot of things that he does has has a Jewish connection. That that's why we should always try to connect with our Jewish roots, the the Old Testament. It's important. It, it's important for us Christians to actually be Jewish, in, in some way to understand. Right the Old Testament and the New Testament mm -hmm. so that we can properly interpret it. So Jesus does, we could say Jesus does not, you know, have any wives, but the church is his wife. If you want to say that the church is the spouse of Christ. Jesus is the king. I don't think that there would be anyone to not say that Jesus is not a king because it's, it's in scripture. He's both priest, prophet, and king. And so Jesus is king, but who's to be the queen? If you have a king, you always have a queen. Who is to be the queen? Well, if the church is queen, well, but who is the church? The church is like everyone, <laughs> you know, everyone that belongs to the church. So who would be queen? Well, if following ancient Israel practices, the natural queen of the king will always be the, the king's mother. Yes. And so that that would be the the Blessed Virgin Mary would, would be the queen. So it it follows uh, ancient Israeli practice that that Mary would be the queen mother of the king, and 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 from the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel related that Jesus would be the King of the Most High, he would be the son of David and the King of the Most High. And so following ancient Israel, if he, if he's the king she would naturally be the queen. She would be the queen mother. The other thing is in the ancient uh, catacombs of Rome, of the early church, the catacombs have iconography in them. So the early Christians would, um, would do, it was the most ancient form of art where they would do pictures and symbols uh, some, you know, over the tombs of, of different people. The most ancient symbol, the most ancient icon or, or image of the Blessed Virgin Mary was they would depict Mary as um, seated on a throne 
with the crown on her head as queen and holding the child Jesus in her arms. And that's the most ancient portraits of the Blessed Virgin Mary that goes way back to the catacombs to the earliest Christian days where the early Christians recognized Mary as queen. And it's, it's really interesting. It it's is real because it, that's in the catacombs itself of depicting Mary as a queen seated on a throne holding the child of Jesus. Father, okay, so we have the tomb of Guadalupe with the miraculous image. We have the Shroud of Turin. We have Eucharistic miracles that we've talked a lot about on this channel. We have uh, the the purgatory souls that burned hands like in the museum in Rome that has all the, the books and the aprons and night clothes that were burned by the hands of souls asking for prayers in purgatory. Um, the divine mercy image also miraculously inspired to St. Faustina. Why do, why do Catholics have all of these physical things like physical proof? And then you have protestants especially evangelicals who are very against you know anything non-spiritual when you talk about our faith what why is there that big difference between us well the the, the one thing is we're, we're human beings so we need concrete images uh to relate to god because we're we're incarnate we're incarnate beings we we have body we have we, we interact with our five senses. We interact like with Jesus our, was <laughs> our ears, our nose, yeah. our mouth, our, our touch. And so because we're incarnate beings, we, we need concrete things. We're not spiritual beings. We're not angels. We, ju we just can't. Re it's hard for us to relate to spiritual things because we're, we're not angels. Yes, we have a soul. So we can relate to spiritual things but not totally and so we so we kind of need those spiritual things to be mediated through um through uh, you know images through th things that work through our five senses so if you think of how jesus healed jesus never healed in the same way all the time sometimes he would lay his hands on people that's touch another time he took mud and he put it in a man's eyes then he he actually spit on the mud and made paste and put it in the man's eyes. Why did Jesus use mud? He didn't have to do it. He didn't have to use something physical, but mm -hmm. he did. He used something physical to heal that man. Um, the the blind man that was in the Poecilium, uh, who who was blind from birth, what did Jesus say? He said he he put mud on his face and he said, "Go and wash in the pool." And he washed in the pool and he was able to see. But why, why, why didn't Jesus just heal him? Why did he go and wash in the pool? Because, because we're physical human beings, because he wanted to use substances of mud, of water uh, to heal people. So you see Jesus who's using physical things all the time. You think of the, the wedding feast of Cana. He uses water and he changes it into wine. He could have just made wine out of thin air. But he didn't. He, he chose to use an element that we're, that we're familiar with. Um, right. it, when he sent the apostles out, he told them to lay their hands on the sick and, and to anoint them, you know, with holy oil. And that's where we get the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. We don't have to use holy oil. We could just pray over it. But, but people like that, that touch, like that oil. O oil is actually a symbol of mercy. I learned that from the Maronite rite. In the Maronite rite, it's actually a symbol of mercy. So oil has significance and was always used to anoint kings and prophets in the Old Testament. So even the Old Testament, they used oil. Why didn't they just anoint them with the power of the Holy Spirit? Because we're physical human beings. So they would use oil. They would use a substance that comes from the tree. So we, so we as, as, as I wouldn't just say Catholics, Christians, all Christians, all people, we use uh, concrete things that that we need just just because we're we're human beings, and um, and e even even for someone to speak the gospel, there, there's a person, there's a, you know, a a a being that you hear a voice, or a preacher, an evangelist. So it's like, why do we go to a preacher and evangelist? Uh, well, because we need to hear 
we need to hear someone speaking the word of God. You know, mm -hmm. we need to assemble. God always wants us to assemble together. That's where we get the word church, to assemble together. Hear the word of God um, and hear someone's, you know, interpretation or, or preaching of it. And, and people have different styles of preaching. You know, there's many ways of hearing that word. Or if, if we go to, say, a healing mass, like I'm going to do a healing mass tonight, that um, the a healing mass is we have the laying on of hands, like you have someone laying their hands, touch. It's very important that, that we have that. So that, that's why we have uh, things of like touch, and, you know, water, we use water, we use oil, uh, we use images because we're, we're concrete human beings. If people object to that, then, then you create a void because we're still human beings. And so the secular world would just easily take over. And you, and you see that we're in an image world. I mean, you see it on the internet. You see it um, with, with you know, all of the social media. It's all an image. You see it with TV, with radio. Why are we attracted to like TV or movies? It, they're images, they're moving images. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that they're bad. I'm just saying that if you create that, if you create a total void in people's life, then yeah, the secular world is going to use all, all the things with our five senses. The devil will use it. The devil will try to use all those things to attract our five senses. And that's where people fall into addictions um, because it's, it's not bad to use your five senses, but if you use it to excess, you can fall into an addiction. E easily i just think of like alcohol like alcohol is something good it's something um e even at mass you know we we as catholics use the the wine and we 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 use the wine and consecrate the wine to be the blood of christ in order to drink the blood of christ because jesus said do this in memory of me but if if we don't use that then then the wine can be abused Wine can be abused, so people will still use wine, but they can uh, they can abuse it. They can use it or they can abuse it. You know, it can, it can be good or it can be bad. And just ask someone who's an alcoholic who's maybe struggling to be sober, uh, struggling for sobriety, and and they're trying to deal with other issues in their life, but they're using that alcoholism. It becomes an addiction, so they have to go to AA. They need lots of prayers and they, and they struggle and they, you know, and it, it becomes very difficult um, for them, you know, to be able to use alcohol in its right way. And, and some who are, who are sober won't, won't even touch alcohol because they know it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a temptation for them, that that's something that, that was good, but um, becomes an addiction and temptation. Right. for them so so and just in our world there's going to be things that are going to attract our five senses all the time but but why not consecrate our five senses to god why not you like i, I tell people take holy water or holy oil and bless your five senses bless your eyes because so many things attract us through our eyes bless your ears right, right. for music bless your nose for smell bless your mouth for taste and bless your hands for for touch, so we we can consecrate these these senses to God, and use them. But but we need concrete things such as holy oil, holy water, um, which are sacramentals. Bless your ears. Thanks.
if you're not obsessed by, especially people that are interested in paranormal, supernatural things, is Fatima. Have you heard that there is a whole faction of people into UFOs who believe that Fatima, especially the Miracle of Sun, was a UFO thing? No, I never heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently they've gone back to the original reports and everything, and they said that it's everybody talked about a metallic object in the sky and that it moved the same way that a lot of UFOs move. And it's really wild. I mean, it's one I've, I've talked recently, I've noticed, I did a show last week that there seems to be a lot of like, um, a lot of factions uh, of other denominations that are really bashing the, the Catholic church lately. And this is one of the things that, that, I see come up a lot, especially in the kind of things that I've, I'm interested in with the paranormal and everything is that, um, yeah, they just really don't like Fatima. <laughs> Can you talk to, a little bit about Fatima? What the, I know the, that you, I've seen you do whole programs on Fatima and the miracle of the sun. Yeah. The, the, the main message of, of Fatima, first of all, was prayer and reparation. That, that, that was the, the main message was, um, to to inspire people to pray, especially prayers for peace, because it was during World War I, and to make reparation for sins, because the 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 first um, visions that the children had were of an angel. It was the guardian angel of Portugal, and the guardian angel of peace, and the angel was asking the children make reparation for sins against the Eucharist. Is that that's why the angel, that's why there was a chalice and a host suspended. And the angel went down um, prostrate. He, he was actually prostrate on the ground and the children followed the angel. And then he prayed these prayers of reparation, which we can still do. And then the Blessed Mother, when she appeared, she asked the children to further make reparation. She showed the children a vision of hell to show them that this is where the souls of poor sinners go if we don't pray and make reparation for them. And so the, the, the children were doing, um, you know, they were praying the rosary, they were making acts of reparation. And then the Blessed Mother said that if people do not pray or make reparation or do the what's called the first Saturdays in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and Sacred Heart of Jesus, that another great war would come, World War II. And she said, if people still don't pray, make reparation, then communism will spread its errors all around the world, persecuting the church, persecuting good people, various nations will be annihilated. And so that, that's what we, we, we would call it like the second secret of Fatima. The third secret of Fatima was again, reiterating, reiterating the message for prayer and penance. Because the first thing that the children saw was an angel over the earth with a sword sheath and he, he was pointing to the earth saying, penance, penance, penance. And then Our Lady interceded for the earth with, with her raised. And, um, and then she saw the vision of the persecution of the church in the 20th century. First of all, with the Holy Father being persecuted. And then the good people, the, the, the bishops, priests, laity, who were, um, who were persecuted and martyred. And then the blood of the martyrs was was gathered up by the angels and sprinkled upon the people making their way uh, to uh, you know to God uh, on their life's journey. So it would so that was about also not just prayer and reparation but persecution, persecution of the church. Of if you do pray and make reparation, you will be persecuted as a Christian. So then the great miracle of the sun on October 13th, that that was to confirm the uh the messages of our lady of fatima that that they were true that and we know it was the sun because it was raining all night people were soaked from head to foot they were in mud and then when the sun began spinning in the sky the sun was coming toward the earth and as it was coming toward the earth it dried the ground completely and dried the people's clothes completely a ufo could not do that if you and many people were converted that were atheists. Many people were converted that were atheists. Many people that were in the secular papers. Yeah, there was healings. There were physical healings. I don't think UFOs can can do physical healings or convert 
people. So it was, it was a miracle by God. The miracle was actually supposed to be greater than what it was. But because of the imprisonment of the children in August, the Blessed Mother said the miracle would be less than what it was. Wow. Because of the mayor of the town. I wonder yeah. what she had in mind, because that was so, a pretty so good the one. The miracle was actually supposed to be even greater than, than what it was, but it was a supernatural miracle. The, 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 the miracle, when what Lucia saw is when Lucia saw the Blessed Mother, the Blessed Mother spoke to her. And then when the Blessed Mother was ascending into heaven, Lucia saw the Blessed Mother with the sun around her, which corresponds to the book of Revelation of the woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. And that's what she saw. And that's why Lucia said, look at the sun. She said she was inspired to say that because she saw a lady clothed with the sun mm. at that moment. Wow. So, so it's interesting. So the sun, our lady, book of Revelation, it all has a lot of significance that's there. It, it, a lot of times, you know, we have our own pre preconceived notions of seeing things. Yeah. And so we, we want to we instill our own beliefs or, um, or, or whatever it is, or our own modern way of, of seeing things. And actually, it's, it's better to just read something objective as it is from the, from the visionaries themselves, from their own perspective, and get the visionary's interpretation of what it was instead of adding our own interpretation of it. That, that's why the Old Testament is very important to, to try to read in its original context, try to read it in Hebrew if you can, because we can really misinterpret it in English. Same with the New Testament. We can misinterpret it if we don't really know Greek or, or Greek phrases or idioms or, you know, whatever. And so that's why, that's why sometimes going to scholars who really know the ancient languages and interpretation and trying to get as accurate an interpretation as possible. And, and that's, why, that's why we have the magisterium of the church is to accurately interpret scripture for us, that God sent the Holy Spirit upon the church and it was the church to accurately interpret scripture for us so that we would not err. Otherwise, then, then you have everyone that's a magisterium and everyone believes their own thing. And then you have separation right. splits right. in the church and, and Christ never wanted that. And it, it, was, it was the church through oral interpretation that actually passed down the word of God, even before the Bible. The Bible, the, the Bible, the New Testament was not formed until 300 and like 80 years after the birth of Christ. So for 380 years, the people did not have the full canonical Bible. They, they, they did have, let's say like Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and they were in, interpreted and they, they were translated in many languages, but it really was the oral interpretation that actually came first before the written interpretation. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not downplaying the written word of God. All I'm saying is that the oral word of God tradition actually came first before before right. the written word and we had the written word in a canonical form to say okay which books do we accept which books do we not accept and that was actually the church to accept um certain gospels and reject other gospels what we call the gnostic gospels today so that so that's where we we, we both need scripture and tradition and magisterium together. To the Gnostic us. Gospels, that's like the Gospel of Thomas. and Yes, those... they were all Gnostic Gospels. Okay. And, and they were thrown out at, at the Con Council of Constantinople. They, they, they were thrown out as heretical Gospels that were not inspired. And that's where the, the church at the Con Council of Constantinople accepted the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because, because they, they had a historical tradition and an oral tradition that went all the way back to the apostles with certain uh, communities. Father, it's really interesting that in the 1500s, when the image of Guadalupe was made all over, you know, the Western world, the European world, that the church was splitting apart. Martin Luther and Henry VIII. And then you have 
our blessed mother <laughs> converting all these millions of people and this devotion is so strong till today still today to our lady of guadalupe we have the shrine of our lady of guadalupe here in chicago and every december there are millions of people that come from all over the world to this shrine it's crazy people walk they walk there for like 20 30 miles to go to the shrine for the masses and for the, the the feast day. It's crazy. And I'm sure you have the same where you are. We, we, we don't have it as much on December 12th here, I guess, because it's in the, in the middle of winter. Winter, yeah. New England. <laughs> so you really have to make a, a sacrifice and effort. But pe people love our, our Lady Guadalupe, especially in Mexico. You, you could watch it on the Spanish channel uh, where the mariachis are singing. Really they have her all on their t-shirts they paint them on oh, the yeah. paint her on the hoods of their cars <laughs> and and you know the the mexican people have brought that love and devotion here to the united states and yeah. to north america and our, our lady guadalupe is she's the patroness of all the americas so um so all you know everyone from the americas should love her because she's she's our mother she's our i mother. just read yesterday that the place that she appeared is the exact geographical center of the Americas. Exactly. Exactly. Crazy. Yeah. So it's the exact geographical center of the Americas of both North and South of the longitude of the Americas. And this so is before the Americas were established. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So th there's a lot of things on the image that the Native Americans saw that were, where they would see the hills on the image and um, they, 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 they would study it at like a map, you know, and, and that's where we can study it as a star map today because the, the, the constellations in the image, um, the, the one thing about the constellations is that they all represent different things. And so you have the constellations on the image when you study it today, it actually represents the book of Revelation. It's amazing. So for instance, you have uh, Corona, which is right above Our Lady's head, which represents the crown, the Corona Borealis. Then you have Draco the dragon, its face is facing Our Lady. So Draco symbolizes a dragon, which is in the book of Revelation chapter 12, and he's immediately facing Our Lady. Then you have Leo the lion, who is right where Mary's womb is. And Leo represents the lion, represents Christ. Christ is the lion of Judah. And then beneath Leo the lion, you have Hydra. And Hydra represents the serpent, constellation of the serpent. And the serpent's head is, is right there, ready to devour Leo the lion, which, which again corresponds to Revelation chapter 12 of the serpent, the ancient dragon, ready to devour the child that Mary is about to give birth. What's interesting is that Hydra has, um, has its tail and where its tail is and the actual image of our Lady Guadalupe, there's seven constellations that are missing in the image. So, you, so all the constellations line up, except that, I mean, seven constellations, there's seven stars that are missing right at Hydra's, Hydra's tail. And that's really interesting because how could you have seven constellations, seven stars missing? Because it says in the book of Revelation that the dragon took its tail and it swept a third of the stars from the sky. So it so that that's how that when I when I was doing this, I, I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, am I making this up? Is does this really correspond to the book of Revelation or not? And then when I saw that that there were seven stars missing, I said, it does. It does. It is telling us a story wow. about the great battle in, in the heavens. And then you have, um, you have Virgo, which is right above Our Lady's heart. Virgo represents a virgin. as a virgin, so Our Lady has a virgin's heart. We know her as the Virgin Mary. Then you have Scorpio, and Scorpio represents the scorpion. And the scorpion's tail is pointed right at Our Lady's heart interesting ready to pierce mm -hmm. her heart sing her heart and then you have um i i, I would have to do it on a powerpoint <laughs> on a powerpoint but i'm just trying to remember 
then then you have different constellations. I'll put it, I'll put when I add it to yep. the video, I'll put the image up that shows the constellations. Sure. So you then, then you have different constellations that are, are uh, either guarding Our Lady, guarding her heart, protecting her from Draco or Scorpio. And then, so you have good constellations in there that are helping the Blessed Mother. Like one of them is Orion. So Orion represents the hunter and Orion is right where the angel is beneath our lady and which Christians would have seen that as an angel. Native Americans would have seen that as Juan Diego. So, so one of the things about the, um, the images on the Tilma, if you look at it from like a Native American point of view, one symbol does not represent one interpretation. One symbol can represent hundred thousands of interpretations because you're dealing with a pictographic language. Mm-hmm. And so where oh, the where the angel is, so if you want to see it in a Christian perspective, where the angel is, where the angel is holding up our lady is the constellation Orion, which represents the hunter, which would represent Saint Michael the Archangel in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, who Saint Michael is is helping our lady, who's fighting against the dragon. And so it's, so you have, so it's, it's interesting because you have all the, you have different good constellations that are fighting for Our Lady, for Christ, for the church. And then you have evil, bad constellations that represent evil that are trying to help the false trinity, which is Draco the dragon, Hydra the serpent, and Scorpio the scorpion. And so it's, it's a cosmic battle within Our Lady's Tilma itself that represents, I think, our times in the cosmic battle between Christ, his church, and Satan, and maybe his false church. Right. Do you think we're close to Jesus coming back? I I don't know. I can't speculate on that. All all I know is that our, our Lord allowed us to discover this on the image of the Tilma, through computer imagery, which wouldn't wouldn't have been discovered, say, 100 right. years ago or 50 years ago. Um, it was discovered through computer imagery for our times for to allow us to see that cosmic battle that's in the heavens between the angels, but also the battle here on earth. And the battle corresponds to the book of Revelation, in which it's a, it's a battle for souls. It's a battle between virtue and vice. And you don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that there is a spiritual battle that's out there. If, if you're a Christian trying to live a, a good Christian life, a virtuous life, you know it's tough. You know it's a battle. You know you need all the help from heaven that, that you can get. And, and you need God's, God's grace and God's help. And I think that's what this, this image is, is telling us, is that, yes, there is a great battle. That Satan is trying to steal Christ from our souls, and but but we do have a lot of help uh, in the battle, also with right. with other angels and saints helping us, and other Christians praying for us, and the Blessed Mother who prays for us, and Jesus who's who's helping us and redeeming us. So, but it's it's significant. Whether this is the last time's final to I don't even want to say that. I, I, we 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 don't know we we don't know we do know that we're in a great battle we do know that we're in a great battle in modern society um where where different things are trying to clamor for our our attention and and different things are trying to lead us astray from christ but but then there's many good things trying to lead us to christ at the same time and so the 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 battle is is within each one of us within our hearts within our souls and and we need and we need God's grace to help us in this battle. Yes, we do. And that's what the image of Our Lady is showing. And I think that's why she's she's still there. She's still intact in Mexico, saying to us, "I have not abandoned you." I have not as much as like the Native Americans were going through very difficult times. They were feeling enslaved. And it was a very difficult time, a very difficult time for the church during the Protestant Reformation. I think Heaven Our Lady's image there that she's saying, I have not abandoned you. 
I've not abandoned you. I'm still with you. God is still going to work greater good. Hopefully we could be one church and one family in Christ in, in the future. I always pray for that. I yes. always pray that, that we become one again, that, that, that we're brothers and sisters and sometimes we're at each other's throats. And, and that's not what God wants us to be. God wants us to encourage one another and to help one another and pray for one another. And if we consider each other enemies, then he says, pray for your enemies. Love your yes. enemies. <laughs> All right. Good for those who hate you. You know, pray for those who persecute you. So we, we should we should, you know, all support one another. Even if we disagree, we, we need to pray for one another and pray for that spirit of truth and, and goodness and spirit of prayer to come down upon each one of us. Father, will you finish with a prayer for us? Sure, sure. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love and mercy. We ask you to bestow your grace upon us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the redemption of Jesus Christ, through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, all the angels and the saints. We ask you to restore our hearts to your love, to your goodness. We thank you for all the blessings that you have given us. And we ask that you continue to work in our lives, and our struggles, no matter where we're at, no matter how much we're searching for you, or searching for your truth, or exploring, Lord, we ask for that gift of faith to come down upon each and every one of us. And we ask this all through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks so much again for being here. It was lovely to meet you sort of in person. And uh, thank you so much for everything that you've done for our family. We pray for you every day, multiple times a day. Pray thank with you. you multiple times a day. We're thank always, you for your always, prayers. always. I, with I always you. take prayers. I always take prayers. <laughs> well, you People got always say, well, What can I give you? And I say, Give me prayers. Yes. Give me prayers. <laughs> us priests need prayers all the time. Well, you got them the from us. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, well, have a wonderful um, day. And I'll send you the link. to hear about, hear about your own conversion story. That 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 was great hearing that. Oh, good. Yeah. Yes. It, um, yeah, it's like I said, one of the many miracles of the pandemic, I think. Yeah. 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 And it was kind of like you were always interested in the supernatural, but then, um, you know, God used that interest to bring you into the yeah. Catholic church. Yeah. You know, I was a paranormal investigator for probably 20 years um, and then, and I never, no, we, we, we never tried to talk to ghosts or anything like that. Right. Mm -hmm. It was always, you would just use environmental monitoring tools. You would interview the family, you would observe things. And, um, then, you know, with that whole explosion of the paranormal in, on TV and everything, yeah. you know, all the ghost hunting shows, that was the focus of all those shows communicating with spirits. Mm -hmm you know, profit, like real time two way communication. Yep. And I got swept up, up and all of that. It was like, you know, you got, I like, I had to do that if I was going to maintain my, you know, my place in the culture, you know what I mean? Mm. And I got so swept up in it. And I had to think back, like, can I still do this without doing all this? And I really, of course I can still do, you know, help yeah. people and, and study this without, doing this thing that's expressly forbidden so yeah it was a journey for sure that's right because a lot of those ghosts are souls in purgatory right and, and that's part of the marian charism is pray for the souls in purgatory right. have you ever been to gettysburg oh yes because gettysburg is the most haunted place in the united absolutely. states absolutely like you can the feel ghost it in the air I love the Gettysburg ghost tours. Yeah. So, <laughs> it really tell all these stories. Yeah. I told my husband, uh, our daughter went to, she was going to be in the Marines and she had a, a she almost died of he, a heat injury when she went to mm. boot camp at um, Quantico a few mm. years ago. And he drove her there. And I said, before you come home, you have to go to Gettysburg and just stay there one night. It's great. And he's, great. he's so spooked. He's a tough guy, cop, fireman. Mm -hmm. So tough. He's, you know, he's not afraid of anything. And he was so spooked. He said he wouldn't even go outside at night when he was mm -hmm. at the hotel. So well, they, yeah. they, they said because they, they had so many casualties in Gettysburg that that they didn't have enough graves to to bury all the soldiers 
and yeah. they just have mass graves all over. So, so yeah, and you see Gettysburg, the monuments everywhere. They say Gettysburg, the whole, the whole entire city is a graveyard. Yes. There, it's a yes. graveyard. And I think that's why people have so many ghost sightings because they're souls in purgatory that need prayers. And I think back, it just breaks my heart. I think back the thousands of investigations that I did where I would record the voices. And sometimes you hear these voices talking and 90% of the voices, they say, help, help me, help us. And you just don't even, you throw them away because you don't, they're not interesting, you know? And I think like, oh my gosh, all those people were asking for help. So yeah, I have this whole thing now called pray for ghosts where every month I like pick a different site and I ask people to pray with me for the the souls there. Some of the, you know, some of these very haunted places. So I just feel awful, awful that I just neglected all those people. Well, and you so know what? You know, it got, God, God, God can still use that because God took you to all those places. Yes. Allowed you to listen to the souls in purgatory. And now you can pray for them. You can offer masses for them. Yes. So like the St. Gertrude prayer, I pray all the time at 3 p.m. That's one of the prayers I pray with the chaplet. I pray the St. Gertrude prayer because that's the hour of mercy. That's the one to release a thousand souls from thousand purgatory. thousand souls from purgatory. Yeah. And, and you just pray that all the time. And, you, and you, your guardian angel knows every place that you've been to. And so you could ask your guardian angel when you offer a prayer for the souls in purgatory to apply it to every single person. That's a great idea. That ever asked for your prayers. Yes. Yes. That's why I say that the, there might be a reason, a hidden reason, even though, yeah, you, you were in sin and just exploring, you know, guess, ghosts, but God could also use that for good. You know? Yes. The souls in purgatory. Yeah. Uh, I always, I always have a funny expression for the souls in purgatory because, because, you know, souls in purgatory will moan and groan because they're, they're, they're in pain. I mean, they're, they're, they're right. suffering, they're suffering souls. So they'll moan and groan and they, and that's where God allows them to get your attention and, and stuff or they'll throw objects and stuff like that. And, um, and I always say the souls in purgatory, please don't wake me up in the middle of the night <laughs> moaning and groaning and asking for prayers i said i need my sleep <laughs> i'll pray for you i'll offer masses but just let me sleep don't be throwing <laughs> objects in my room i need to get my attention yeah <laughs> true <laughs> i've never had that i've never, I've never had like, objects thrown in my room i love and it and groaning and voices yep that's <laughs> great I need my sleep <laughs> I need my sleep well, thanks so much again, Father. Have a wonderful okay. rest of your day. Okay, you're welcome. Bye. God bless you. Take care. Right, God bless you. Bye. Thanks for listening to this Present Darkness. The video version of this podcast is available on Ursula Bielski's World of the Supernatural YouTube channel. Be sure to become a subscriber by signing up with Buzzsprout today. And remember to sign up for the World of the Supernatural mailing list at worldofthesupernatural.com for our monthly newsletter and more. And don't forget to support the podcast through Patreon.